And Holy Spirit, we pray this morning that your tangible presence, not the theoretical presence, but your, your tangible, uh, experienced presence would rest on us here and now. Uh, as it has through worship, we pray even now as we examine uh, your holy scriptures, uh, Holy Spirit, that we would learn more about your heart, who you are, what you're doing in this world, the plans that you have, and we would get caught up in that agenda this morning. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Whew. Well, you guys can, uh, can grab a, uh, a seat. And uh, JT, thank you so much for sharing that. Um, uh, real quick, if you're uh, going to follow along with me. Wow, those are cheap. It's okay. They're just microphones. No big deal. Um, <laughs> we're collecting an offering right now. No, I'm just kidding. Just kidding. <laughs> Uh, so I'm going to be in, uh, in Acts 2 and John 16 this morning. And uh, so I invite you to follow along, mainly uh, John chapter 16. Uh, uh, while you're flipping there, uh, our family is uh, planning to take a trip in the next couple of weeks. We have a, uh, somebody that we just love dearly who's getting married all the way in uh, California, which is uh, way out there. Victor loves California. And uh, apparently, I just learned that right now. Um, and uh, it was going to be Eric and I, but we decided we're going to bring our, our whole crew with us. We figured, hey, why not? They've never been. Um, it's like the microphones. It's cheap, right? So we decided we're going to take the whole crew. And uh, we told them that uh, a couple of weeks ago, right before Easter. And that is all they can talk about right now. And, and I've realized that kids oftentimes have no idea how time works. Like, no clue. They'll be, they'll be like, are we going to California tomorrow? And I'm like, well, no, we, uh, it's a little, little ways away, a couple months. Well, what, what about the day after tomorrow? I'm like, no, honey, we got to get through Easter. We got to get through um, Mother's Day, your daddy's birthday, your grandma's birthday, and then we're going to go. And they're like, well, is tomorrow Easter? No, tomorrow's not Easter. Well, are we going to California tomorrow? No, we're not. And I, we go over and over, and I... They have no clue. I think, Grace, I even saw a post that you did about a conversation you had with your daughter that they have no idea. Uh, in fact, um, it was not yesterday. It was Saturday. On Friday, we were swimming at um, Erica's parents' pool, and my, my daughter, my four-year-old, uh, all of a sudden decided she was afraid of water, which I don't know when that happened because she's been in the water her whole life. But she's, like, crying, afraid of the pool. And I'm like, honey, what's wrong? And she goes, we missed going to California. And I'm like, no, we didn't. What? How did you even get to that spot right there? I just... Kids have no clue how time works. Minutes, seconds, years, decades, it's all the same, and you can flip-flop it all around. And I feel like sometimes the church is that way when it comes to the timeline of how things work in the church. Like, we know there was like a resurrection, and Adam and Eve were somewhere, and at some point Jesus is coming back, and Satan's in there in some portion, but we lack the understanding of how the timeline works. And so I, if, you're, if you're new to church uh, or if you're old to church and you just never have been told this, I want to quickly walk through from Palm Sunday up through Pentecost Sunday, which is what we're celebrating today, the beginning of the church. And this will help give some context to things. So you have Palm Sunday, which is the week before Easter. That's when you wave all the palm branches and shout Hosanna and the kids come back with the palm branches and they shred them in your car and you still have problems with that a couple years later and you're not bitter about it. But that's, uh, that's Palm Sunday. And then a week later is Easter and you all know all about Easter. I mean, that's the, the beautiful, beautiful story that Jesus conquered the grave, that although they killed him on Friday, he beat death on Sunday. And we celebrate that every single day because it's not reserved just for Easter. Like that's the good news of the gospel that Jesus overcame the grave. And after he overcame the grave, he did not go straight back to heaven. He spent 40 days visiting different people that he had relationship with here on this earth. There were times when he hung out with Mary. There were times when he cooked breakfast on a beach. There was times when Thomas literally felt the holes in his hand. There was all of these appearances that happened during that 40-day window. After those 40 days is the ascension. That's where he ascended back into heaven and said, wait for the Holy Spirit. 10 days later, so 40 plus 10 is 50 for all you math people out there. So 50 days after Easter is when we celebrate Pentecost. Penta meaning 50. 50 days later, we celebrate the moment where the Holy Spirit came down and the church began. And I don't know why 
Churches don't celebrate this as much as they do Easter. I mean, granted, conquering the grave is a pretty big deal. But like today, this is the beginning of the gathering we see right here in the book of Acts chapter 2 is where we see the first church service taking place. About 120 people hanging out. And this is what we see in Acts chapter 2. When the day of Pentecost arrived, they were all together in one place. And suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. They were actually up in this upper room, and they were sitting in the house, and this is when the Holy Spirit came. And divided tongues as a fire appeared to them and rested uh, it, it, the tongues of fire appeared to them and rested on each one of them. So, so literally these little tongues of fire were on every single person and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. That, that's the first public gathering right there. And I know for, for some of you, if you walked into a church service like that, you'd be like, whoo-hoo, checking out the, street, the church down the street. And, and others of you may be like, well, that's, isn't that how it's supposed to look? Let me just say, when the Holy Spirit entered into this first church gathering, it was radical. It was not a typical American church gathering that took place. For the record, I love American church. I absolutely do. But when I I read this, I'm like, "This this was pretty extreme. And out of this, people began speaking in tongues. We saw prophecy start to take place. We saw supernatural boldness taking place. There was healings that were taking place. There were all of these spiritual gifts that started to to unravel from this moment. It was this this mighty rushing power that entered into the church. And in fact, it was so wild that there were spectators. I mean, think about it. If there was like a spectator out in the hall, it was like the church service got so crazy that they were thinking that there was like a college kegger going on in the service. I mean, it says this. Verse 15, it doesn't say college kegger, but it does say, for these people are not drunk as you suppose, since it's only the third hour of the day, implying they may have been the night before, but they're not right now. Like there was this, this time happening where things were so radical so out of the box, so not American cookie cutter, that people went, man, now these people are right. They've been hitting the bottle too hard this early in the day. Like this is something unusual that's taking place. And I want to set that up right there to say, I fully believe in that. Without a shadow of a doubt. I am a full gospel preacher, and by that I mean that everything that's found in the gospels, that's found in the Bible, including this passage, is absolutely true. And so when it says things like we should pursue speaking in tongues, guess what? I pray in tongues, and it's an absolutely beautiful thing. I believe that's for today. I believe healings are for today. I've had people prophesy over me, and it's come true, and it has been edifying to me. I have seen all of these things take place. That is for today today. I, I, it, it's, it's not even up for debate. Like it's, it's in the Bible. Like if you debate it, take it up with him, not with me, because this is found in scripture without a doubt. I'm going to add to this that oftentimes we become, and when I say we, I'm talking to Michael a lot, hyper obsessed with the manifestations, which is basically the physical uh, showing of these inward spiritual moments, become hyper-obsessed with a physical manifestation of the Spirit. And we miss that there's something even greater that Jesus is doing. He's doing something far beyond these miraculous things that we see. So l- let, me, let me say that when it comes to all these moves of the Spirit, uh, it needs to be done in order. We serve a God of order. He is not confusing by any means. There is a system that has been in place since the beginning of time all the way to the end of the time. Adam and Eve were very, very present. And from then we go to David, then we go to Jesus. We see there's this lineage that takes place. We see all of the tribes of Israel that are working their way through um, all of the different trials they have. We see the Old Testament finishes. The New Testament starts. We see the calling of the disciples. We see Jesus's life, death, burial, and resurrection 
resurrection and then his ascension. We, there's a system to all of this stuff. Nothing should be all that confusing about it. It even says in 1 Corinthians, for God is not a God of confusion, but of peace. And if you want to, on your own time, read 1 Corinthians 14, you would see there's very clear expectations and requirements for how the church should function and how we should move in all of those things. So at the birth of the church, which is what we're celebrating today, at the moment where the Holy Spirit rested on people for the first time and all these gifts began to happen, Yes, it was super impactful. I mean, imagine walking into a church service in a different country and all of a sudden people start speaking your language, all of them. Like that would be you'd be like, wow, this is a miracle what is happening. This should not happen. It's a sign that God is doing something bigger. And I believe that the falling of the Holy Spirit, that Pentecost Sunday, that the, Ameri- the, 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 the celebration the church does right now points to something bigger than we see at a first glance. And that's why we're going to go to the book of John chapter 16. Now, let me, let me set the story right now, kind of set the, set the environment. Um, This is before Jesus hangs on the cross, before he's killed, before he's buried, before he's resurrected, before he ascends to heaven, before the Holy Spirit falls. Jesus is talking to his disciples and he's telling them some things. He's saying, Hey guys, I'm getting ready to leave. It's not the first time he said this. In fact, in John chapter 13, he says it the first time, and they get all upset. All of his believers are like, what do you mean, Jesus, you're leaving? You can't leave me right now. How am I going to make it through this? Jesus, I need you right now. Don't leave me. I'll do anything you need me to do. And they get a little bit upset that Jesus is leaving. That was the first conversation. This is the second conversation, John chapter 16. But now I am going to him who sent me. And none of you ask me, where are you going? He's referencing that first conversation, basically saying, you guys aren't asking that question anymore. The disciples were more concerned with themselves than with what Jesus was doing with the world. How often is that the church right there? That we become more concerned about what's going on in our life, in our bubble, than what Jesus is doing in the world. You see this, church thing, this gospel thing, this gathering thing, this part of the body of Christ thing. It's about you, but it's not about you. Like the the church is on a mission. The church is on a mission to seek and save the lost, hands down. But the moment that you become a believer, the moment that you cross over from an unbeliever to a believer, which there's a definitive line, you are now in the ranks and it's no longer about you. And I know sometimes like we serve, we get involved, and we're like, oh, I feel like this isn't about me. You're right. You're absolutely right. These disciples were more concerned with themselves than what Jesus was doing in the world. And that sets up the conversation that Jesus gives them. He says, but because I've said these things to you, sorrow has filled your heart like, oh, this world's not about me. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. Turn to your neighbor and say, your advantage. Aren't you thankful you can see smiling faces in the auditorium today? Woo! Some of y'all are like, no, that's an angry person next to me. That's not a pretty mug that I just saw smiling at me. Jesus says, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the helper slash comforter, slash Holy Spirit, will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. Jesus is letting him know that he has to leave earth in order for the Holy Spirit to come. Uh, I'm in the process of training my second child on how to ride a bike without training wheels. And I'm, I'm remembering back to the first time my oldest rode his bike without training wheels. And I did what the dads do or moms do or whoever the bike instructor of the family is, grandma, grandpa, uh, dog sitter, whoever. And I took the training wheels off and and I would kind of run with him behind and he would say, daddy, don't let go. Daddy, don't let go. Don't let go. Don't let go. And I didn't let go at first. And what I did is in our front yard, we have like a little slope at the beginning. and, And I knew that gravity kicks in when you go down that slope. Gravity is a powerful, powerful force. If you're on a bike and gravity kicks in, you begin to pick up momentum. You can ride it down the hill, right? And so when he's on his training wheels, he could not 
fully experience gravity because he's held back by those wheels. When I'm holding on to the back of his seat trying to keep him stable, he cannot fully experience the power of gravity because I'm holding on. But something happened to where I removed the training wheels, I removed my hand, and because I had left the moment, he was able to experience power that he had never seen before. And he goes, Daddy, this is kind of fun. I don't really have to work right now. I can go a lot faster. I can do more with less effort. It sounds a lot like when the Holy Spirit is moving in your life. And he could have been hyper-focused on where's daddy? How come he's not here? Where are my training wheels? Oh no, these things are gone. I'll tell you this, where there is an absence, there is an opportunity. Where there is something that you feel is missing is the opportunity for the Holy Spirit to fill that way that the other thing could not have been able to fill that much. And that is the beauty of the Holy Spirit moving in your life. And I'm going to tell you, that's huge. But that's actually not what Jesus is talking about right here. He's got something even deeper than this. I remember when I went to Bush Gardens for the first time, 21 years old, had never been on roller coasters before because I was terrified of them. Uh, thankfully, I've changed my opinion since then, but it was all about eating the German food there. That was the reason why I went to Bush Gardens. It was not for roller coasters. It was for bratwurst. Thank you, Jesus, for bratwurst and liverwurst and all the other worsts that are present. I love them all. And I, thank you. I needed that. I realized afterwards that as good as those are, coasters are a lot more fun. I enjoy those things. And there was, a, there was something else that was even bigger than what I thought. And that's what Jesus is going to hit on right here. Jesus is about to preach a three-point sermon about the Holy Spirit. Verse 8. He's talking about the Holy Spirit. When he comes, he will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment. Concerning sin, because they do not believe in me. Verse 10. Concerning righteousness, because I go to the Father and you will see me no longer. Third point, concerning judgment because the ruler of this world is judged. Let's work our way through these for a second. Um, Have you all ever seen the movie Up? Anybody here? Can we talk about the first minute and a half of that movie? You all realize how depressing the beginning of that movie is. Like it's this, I remember we took took our kids to the movie theater. I'm like, what did I just get my kids signed up for right now? This is the worst movie that is ever, it's so depressing at the beginning. But if I would have walked out in that moment, I would have missed a really, really awesome movie. Let me tell you, these three points right now, if you only hear point one, you're missing it. You got to hear all three points that Jesus is doing. First point right here. The Holy Spirit is present to make the world aware of sin. That is one of the functions of the Holy Spirit. I know sin is a, is a topic that is not necessarily politically correct. Cancel culture is all over that. Whatever you want to do, you can do is right for you. Whatever I want to do is right for me. The Bible and God himself seem to paint, I'm not even going to say seem, do paint a different picture than that. There are things that are morally correct, and there are things that are morally incorrect. And the fact is, is I have things in my life, I'm not immune to this, we have things in our life that are sinful. Like we are sinful people. We do things that God says, don't do it, and then we do it, and then we say sorry, and then we do it again. Anybody a sinner like me right now? Can we just have a moment of honesty? Like like there is sin found, and there's consequences for it. Like the Bible says the penalty for sin is death. And not like die and go in the ground, like like die and go to hell. Sin is a big, big deal. And, and, And the Holy Spirit comes to convict us of that. We can't take sin and just sweep it under the rug like no big deal. There's grace in everything. Is there grace in everything? Absolutely through Jesus. But sin is sin. And sin is a problem. And some of us have sin that needs to stop. And the Holy Spirit, when the Holy Spirit's moving in your life, you become abundantly aware of the sinful actions that you need to correct. That is a, more than speaking in tongues, more more than prophecy, more than healing, more than all of these sensational gifts, which are 100% true. Can we talk about the Holy Spirit's role in convicting you of your sin? And, And it should move you to a heartbreak point. 
It should move you to where, where you go to the altar and you say, God, I'm sorry for my mistakes. And I'm sorry I did it again. And without your grace, I'm going to hell because of these things. And, and I, I don't preach that because it's friendly. I preach it because it's truth. Sin is a big deal. is a huge deal. And the Holy Spirit comes, according to Jesus, verse 9, concerning sin is one of the reasons why the Holy Spirit comes. The second one, he says, is it makes the world aware of righteousness found in Christ. And to be transparent, when I was studying this passage, verse 10 tripped me up a little bit. Because I got like concerning sin because they do not believe in me. All right, I understand people don't believe in Jesus. They don't know they're sinners. Verse 10, concerning righteousness, because I go to the Father and you will see me no longer. I'm trying to go, what does righteousness and going to the Father have to deal with each other? Well, it's found in the cross. The fact is, is that righteousness is found in the fact that Jesus conquered the grave and completely defeated death, hell, and sin and rose again to be next to the Father. So righteousness isn't found in you trying to do better. Righteousness isn't found in human effort. Righteousness isn't found in I'm sorry's. Righteousness is found in Jesus. That Jesus is the one that makes us sufficient. And here's how you understand how great righteousness is. Please, please don't miss this. Here's a word for you, depravity. Depravity is your, uh, when you go against morality, any mistake you make, the, the depravity of man, my, my, my temptation to do things Jesus said not to do. Got to catch this. If we minimize our depravity, we minimize Christ's victory. That, that, that's the good news right there is that, that no matter how deep my depravity is, how deep my sin is, Jesus has overcome that. Jesus is sufficient. Jesus is the one that has given me righteousness through his sacrifice. And that is what the Holy Spirit does is it makes me aware of my sin, but also aware of the reality that Jesus conquered it. And that is good news for those who are found in Christ. Yeah. Exceptional news for those who are found in Christ. He says, not only does it make the world aware of sin, not only does it make the world aware of righteousness, but it makes the world aware of judgment. You ever hear people say, well, only God can judge me? No, none of you. None of you have ever heard that. Okay, I'm the only one. Uh, I don't know what earth I'm on, but it's different than yours. I've heard that so many times. Like, don't judge me. Church, don't judge me. Only God can judge me. And I'm thinking it'd be a lot easier if Michael was judging you. Like for real, because I just saw that one action. God not only saw that action, but he knows what's in your mind and in your heart. Ooh, like God, only God can judge me? You're right, and I hope you're on the right side when that takes place. Because this is what happens. We're aware of our sin. We're aware of Christ's victory. But we're also aware of the judgment that takes place. Verse 11, concerning judgment, because the ruler of this world is judged. The devil himself, is going to face judgment. All of those that are on his team, if you will, the demons, those, those who, have, who have gone against Christ, all of these people are going to be found in this final judgment moment. And let me tell you, judgment is a scary thing. And I'm going to invite the worship team back up right now, but judgment is, is actually a scary thing if you're guilty. If, you're, if you've committed the crime, judgment day is not a fun day. But let me say this, judgment has a different spin on it when you're innocent, doesn't it? Like if you were going to judgment day when the judge is getting ready to declare what your sentencing is and you go, hey, actually, I'm innocent. I'm not found guilty. All of a sudden, it goes from this, I know what my sin is to, man, I know the power of Christ. Man, I know the promise of eternity because I am innocent in Jesus. That is what the Holy Spirit does is it moves us from being people that are sinners to being aware of our sin to knowing who Christ is to finding freedom in judgment. And that is a beautiful thing that the Holy Spirit does. And so the birth of the church, which is what we're celebrating today, the birth of the church did not happen so that we can give a bunch of self-help teachings. If you want self-help teachings, like, like go buy a self-help book. They're really good. The birth of the church happened so that we could have some God help me teachings. Because sometimes, all the time, I need something more than a self-help. I need a, Michael is jacked up and needs Jesus to move in his life. 
Holy Spirit, make, make me aware of what's going on. Holy Spirit, draw me to repentance. Draw me to the resurrection. Draw me to this, this beautiful judgment that I'm going to be seen innocent in. And we talk about all these miraculous things. Miraculous gifts are beautiful. Yes and amen. The miracles take place on earth so that earth could see beyond earth. Did you catch that? It may take you a couple rounds of that. I'll, I'll walk you through it right now. There are miracles that happen. People get healed. And the reason why those happen is so that people on earth can realize there's more than just this earth. Because miracles are temporary. That they are. When I get healed, you know, I've had times where I've had pain and people have prayed for me, and all of a sudden the pain is gone in Jesus' name. And I'm thankful for that. But the truth is, at some point, I'm getting a new body, anyways. Prophecy is great. I would love for somebody to give me insight on what's happening in the future. But the, the reality is, is at some point, I'm going to be in the future. I'm already going to be past that. Words of encouragement are great, but at some point I'm going to be beyond that. All these miraculous things are there to point to something that's even greater, which is the fact that you and I and whoever else is uh, found in the body of Christ can inherit all of eternity. The beauty of the birth of the church is that it points to an eternal gathering of the church. It's not just about here and now. It's for all of eternity. And and sin and righteousness and judgment can feel kind of harsh. Unless you realize what they're pointing to. I'll go back to the the bike moment. Uh, One of the the rules I have, oh, I have so many rules in our house. My poor kids. Just weird rules. We have a rule, no yodeling out the window is a rule in our house. I won't give you the full story on it. You can ask my kids. It's a real rule. It's just, so one of them is when you're learning how to ride a bike, you got to put a helmet on. Got to put a helmet on. And I'd see my boy whipping around the corner, no helmet on. I'd be like, okay, buddy, you got to sit down in timeout and your bike's in timeout, no helmet. But daddy, why? I'm telling you, buddy, you got to wear this helmet. Sure enough, the next day, whipping around the corner, no helmet on. You better sit down until you find your helmet. Like we, we keep telling, put on a helmet, put on a helmet, put on a helmet. It sounded really, really mean that I said wear a helmet until he what? Until he crashed. Bonks his head on all the gravel in our drive when he goes, man, dad, I'm so glad you made me wear a helmet. I'm like, yes, your father's the smartest man in the world. Sin, righteousness, and judgment seem harsh until you realize it's pointing you towards everlasting life. Until you realize it's it's the Holy Spirit drawing you to repentance. It's the kindness of the Lord leading you towards everlasting life. That's that's one of the beauties of the Holy Spirit coming down. And and I feel like somebody's got to tell you all this. Somebody's got to tell you that the Holy Spirit is for a good reason convicting you of your sin for a good reason showing you what righteousness is for a good reason showing you the beauty of judgment for those who are found innocent and so I want to invite you to go ahead and stand to your your feet this morning I did a a family wedding um, it's been a number of years ago and I uh, I've shared this with you before but I did the whole wedding with my fly down like, at least it could have been a different family so I didn't have to see him at Thanksgiving. But no, I did the whole thing, like, fly down. And so now every time I get up to speak anywhere, I'm like, okay, am I good? See, I wish somebody would have told me. Like, you ever see that, that, that person who's, like, strutting that girl? This apparently is how girls strut right here. Strutting. <laughs> Why are you judging me, all right? And they're, like, smiling, and they got chocolate on their tooth. And you're like, girl, you just got to brush your teeth before you do that. Like, I wish somebody would tell me that my fly was down or that person had chocolate on their tooth. Like, it's good to know the reason behind these things. Can we be a church that's aware that the Holy Spirit is drawing us into these things? Can we be aware of what righteousness is? Can we be aware of how great judgment is going to be when we're found in Christ? It's because of Jesus and his teachings that we're aware. It's because of Jesus that we're able to love. It's because of Jesus that we can walk in boldness. It's because of Jesus we see the miraculous. It's because of Jesus there's the eternal church. It's because of Jesus that there's victory. And I don't want you to be unaware of that. And so that tells me, man, 
I got a God who's worthy to be praised. I want to be like those 120 who were in that upper room, just waiting and waiting and waiting. And then finally, when God rested his hand in that moment, they were lit on fire, both literally and figuratively, to turn this world upside down. Does anybody want to move like that in their life? Does anybody want to come face to face with what God is doing? Lord, I pray right now, in the name of Jesus, that your Holy Spirit would come down and convict us of our sin. Let us know how great you are. Let let us know how beautiful that judgment day is going to be. God, that you would even begin to move in the miraculous this morning. God, that people who need to have have a tongue would speak in tongues. Father, for the person that needs prophecy, that prophecy would happen, healing would take place. God, whatever you have, we're open to it. And we're not open to it just because it's Pentecost Sunday. We're open to it because you've been faithful and faithful and faithful. And so our response is to reply back and say, God, with everything we have, we trust in you. Jesus, can we give God some praise this morning?